It was early in the 20th century. In the South, cotton had fallen to five cents a pound. Families were losing their farms. Their hope lay in the cities, where new industry promised opportunity and jobs. It was a time of change, and with change would come conflict. Everything's uneven. Try to concentrate on what you're doing. Okay, Mr. Frank. Good morning, Alonzo. Good morning, Mr. Frank. Please see, please see that Mr. Frank gets his lunch. Tell him I'm going to the opera. I'll see him at dinner. Yes, ma'am. flirt with those boys, you'll have to do it on your own time. We were just getting a breath of air. Come on. Are you sick? Cramps. But they'll pass. Well, it may help if you lie down on the bench. Rest for a while.
Oh, Sleeping Beauty, at last I have found you. Oh, Prince, what took you so long? I've been waiting almost a hundred years, although I really didn't mind all too much. Well, I'm sorry, but I only just got born not too long ago. Oh, that's okay. Because now we can all live happily ever after. <laughs> draft of your speech. Wrote it last night. It's, uh, not too bad. I do say so. All I need is a note or two. Uh -huh. Oh, lad, let's not keep the boss waiting. Okay. Unless I'm mistaken, I do believe I spy the future of our great state walking towards us. Hello, Tom. My, but we're all so handsome today. <laughs> You may not be able to handle him, Tom. Popularity. He's clay to be molded, Sally. Mary, come here and finish your breakfast. I don't have time. I want to get to the factory before the parade. I thought you didn't have to work today. I know. I'm just going to pick up my pay. OK. Guess I'm ready. You best take your umbrella, honey. I bet Mary's going to see a fellow. I ain't neither. Anyway, it ain't none of your business. Randy's just teasing you, honey. You're going to stop by and get your wages, huh? ain't you? Yes, Papa. Yeah, I wouldn't ask, but we're running kind of short this week. Want to come with me, Randy? No. I just came to help you, Pop. I'll see you at the parade, though. Bye. Bye, honey. I thought a daughter of mine would have to be working in the factory. <laughs> Down, white boy. I don't have one. Yes, you do. It's in that pocket right there. Leave me alone, Jim. Just one dime, Alonzo. I want a beer. No, Jim, I'm late. Now, folks, I'm sure that you all know Hugh Dorsey, our dynamic young solicitor general. But, but you may or may not know the fine lady on Mr. Dorsey's arm. 
She's the wife of one of our South's most loved heroes. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Stonewall Jackson. <laughs> Sweet talking, her. John, you hush. Poor lady's 80 years old. Oh, hell, boy, you'd marry her if you thought it would mean 50 votes. Hi, Alonzo. Anybody in the office? Mr. Frank's up there. Yes. Excuse me for bothering you, sir, but I've come to pick up my pay. It's number 62. It's a dollar twenty. Would you like to count? Oh, no, it's okay. Thank you. Miss. You look very pretty today. I hope my observation doesn't offend you. Folks, do you know that there are still those today who think Georgia only means cotton? And when you speak to them of, of industry and factories, when you speak to them of iron and steel and textile manufacturing, they speak to you like that old farmer who said, oh, oh you can't get there from here. <laughs> Well, they are wrong. They are as wrong as that old farmer. We can and we will. We live in a, a time of prosperity, a great era of challenge. And the people of Georgia, they, they are hearty, industrious people. And they can meet that challenge. They can bring new prosperity to this great state. Industry means employment. And that employment means a fair wage for every man that wants to work. And, and, I mean to see that we do get there from here. do, boss. <laughs> Sweeping up what's on the floor. You're early, Newt. I've got my accounts to finish, and I, I can't concentrate with you banging around here. To, it's parade day. Why don't you take off for a while till I finish up? Okay. Mrs. Jackson, you are about to witness a demonstration of skill and precision. The governor of Georgia pitching washers. Oh, 
I think I'm a better ladies' man than I ever was a bitch. Yeah. You married the prettiest girl in Georgia. The richest one, too. Put it in there, Tom. Put a magnet in that hole. <laughs> I hear what you're saying. You'd you be helpful go. if you told me. What are you doing here, Lund? You were fired and you know it. I know, Mr. Frank, but I went off and I left a new pair of shoes in my lock. Cost me seven dollars. I want to go in and get them. I, I don't like to have former employees hanging around. I'm not hanging around. I just want my shoes. Take him in and let him get his shoes new, but then make sure that he leaves. I hope he don't decide he wants to stay. falls in love with Rodolfo and then gets sick. It's so romantic. You should come to the opera with me, Leo. Of course, it wouldn't seem as exciting to you. Why not? Well, you're used to it. All those exotic, mysterious ways. Brooklyn isn't exactly Paris. Well, it is compared to here. You people up there, you have all those other lives. All those different ways. That's what I thought of the night I met you. I thought, this isn't just a man I'm meeting. This is a world. Well, I hope I didn't disappoint you. I'm not disappointed. Well, the fireworks are starting. I never have been. I just wish I could be part of it. Ah, uh, you're all of it. Boss, things okay? Well, we even catching a breeze. Well, good. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. Who are you sneaking off to call? If I didn't know better, I'd think you had a sweetheart. No, no, I was Hello, just Uncle checking Z. with the factory. See what a good manager you got when you hired Leo? Even on Saturday night, he managed. Any problem down there? No, 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 no. Everything's fine. Operator, Op operator, give me the police. Please, the police. Police. What? Who is it that's dead, boy? Where is this at? Okay, you stay put. You got killed now. Some colored over at the pencil factory. 
You always come up with a killing when I'm winning. Oh, hell, Brent's drunk again. You want to stick him in a cell? Oh, let him be. Treat a reporter bad and he'll just write ugly about you. boys. We're at the pencil factory. There's been a massacre. A massacre? All right, where's this body at? Uh, it's way down in the basement. I've been trying to get Mr. Frank on the phone, but I can't get him. Who's Mr. Frank? He's the boss, sir. Jesus in the morning. This body's white. Why, it's a little white girl. Who is she? I, I don't know. One of the girls who works in the factory. I, I don't, don't, I don't know. No, sir! Oh, God. Oh, no. Man, he said he would love me and laid down play like night witch did it. What's that? Looks like she wrote it before she died. Man, he said he would love me and laid down play like night witch did it, but that slim black nigra did by himself. I write while he play with me. Child murdered in factory identifies her killer. Mr. Leo Frank? Yes. You're the manager at the pencil company? You'd better come along with us, Mr. Frank. A little girl's been murdered at your place. One of our girls? Now, that'll be for you to tell us. Uh, just let, let me finish dressing. We ain't going to a banquet. You're dressed enough. I, I, I'm the manager of the factory. I, I just can't go in my shirt sleeves. I, I'll just be a minute. Wrong. Trouble at the factory. Yeah. Got that watchman of yours. How long has he been working for you? Newt? He's barely new. About three weeks, I guess. Upstairs. This is Mr. Frank. My God. Do you know Mary Fagan? Is that her? You don't know this girl? I paid one of the workers in the office yesterday. I it could be her. You don't remember her name? No, I don't know her name. How'd you pay her then? She gave me a work number. That's how it's done. I should call Mr. Montag, the owner. There'll be time for that. Mr. Frank, come back here. 
But would you please look at this girl? Is this the girl you paid yesterday? God rest his soul. It could be. How could he do this? Who, you mean the night watchman? No, I mean whoever. I really should call Mr. Montag. He... He won't be pleased. Sorry, Brent. It is a good story. I gave you page one, half a column, below the fold. What? Congratulations. It's good to have you back there. You're not leading with this. It's not a national disaster. I mean, hell, there isn't even a mystery anymore. I mean, they got the night watchman It's already. a murder. You know how many murders there were in this city the past six this months? This isn't some colored woman getting cut up. It's not even another lynching. It's a girl, a little white girl, poor, working in that factory for northerners, 12 cents an hour. Yeah, I got that part. It's still in there, isn't it? My Sunday dinner's getting cold. Al, I didn't write that story. Those people did outside the factory. It was on their faces. Are you drunk again? No, I'm not drunk. It's a great story. What did you expect? Examiner reporter finds murder note? Front page? Some red ink, maybe? Well, you can be damn sure the Constitution would or the journal. You know, maybe you ought to try one of them. Well, that's right. You already have. You forget that? And what you've promised me when I agreed to take you back. Hey, buddy. You like to make yourself a dime. Hey, hold there. Who are you? Copy boy. What happened to Pete? I don't know. I just got here. Boss said to get that to you before you start putting the paper together. I should make up his mind. Oh, I almost forgot. He wanted me to see if you have any red ink. Would you? Rich Yankees. Made that little girl 12 cents an hour and let this happen. You know that man with the glasses just went in there? Oh, I should think I know Mr. Frank. He's my boss. What's the story on him? Is this going in the paper? It might. He ain't so bad, I guess. You know, me and Mary was practically best friends. Ah, uh, this is Randy. He was Mary's neighbor. Well, you know, our families live practically side by side. Really? Excuse me. I thought you wanted to talk to me. I do. Can you take this young lady's picture? For the newspaper? You make sure you spell her name right. <laughs> Thank you. My name's Wes Brent. I was there when they found the body. He do it? The watchman? Well, they're not sure, but they... I should have been there. She asked me to go with her.
The papers are blowing this thing all out of proportion. That must be your mother. Oh, I guess I should say something. I, I just don't know what. Well, you have to do it, Leo. You were her boss. I didn't know the child. Mrs. Fagan. Are you Mr. Frank? Yes, Leo Frank. I, I want you to know that we all sympathize with your tragedy. This is Mr. Montag, the owner of the factory. And this is my wife. Mr. Frank, I just hope they find who done this to my girl. I hope he gets his punishment. She was only 13. <laughs> Just locked up one of the janitors named Jim Connolly. I got Lee, the night watchman. He was right there. Hell, he wouldn't have called us if he'd done it. He would have just took off. Why don't you call in that Jew manager? Frank? Yeah. He was the last one that seen the girl. Tell him we need to ask some questions. As best I remember, she came into my office uh, a little before noon. Why'd you send this, this night watchman off? Well, I hadn't finished my accounts, and he was working and making so much noise, I couldn't concentrate. Anybody else in the factory? No, it was the rain. Where can I find Mr. Frank? Yeah, hold it, sir. Now, that man is my client, and I demand to go in. Hello, Clapton. Howdy, Luther. Why are you barging in here? I didn't know Mr. Frank needed a lawyer. I, I don't need a lawyer. I don't know who this man is. Mr. Frank, my name is Luther Rosser. Sid Montag engaged me this morning to see that the interests of the company are protected. Sir, you are not my lawyer. I don't have a lawyer. I don't need a lawyer. Now, <laughs> Mr. Frank. You may know a lot about the pencil business, but you evidently don't know how the law works. Have any charges been brought? Charges? Charges for what? They already have Newt Lee. Uh, Lee is just a suspect. Isn't that right? What about the note? It, it said the night watchman. Now, Mr. Frank, I would advise you against saying anything more now until we've had a chance to discuss this. What in the world are you getting at? Are, are you trying to tell me that, that I'm a suspect? Now, Mr. Frank, there is a great public outrage. Uh, Chief Clapton's job might be in trouble, for all I know. I would imagine everyone connected with the pencil factory is a suspect at this point. What is this, Chief? Surely you don't suspect me. My God. People think I killed that little girl. You saw the body. She must have fought like a tigress. You saw how scratched up she was. Well, whoever killed her must be scratched up as well. This is the same suit I wore on Saturday. Look at it. Well, if I had killed her, wouldn't there be blood on it? Look. Now calm down, Frank. All we know is that you're the last man to see little Mary alive. Like I say, all we're trying to do right now is get the timetable straight. Finally.
Mr. Watson, sir, that little factory girl was murdered. I think I should represent the party at her funeral tomorrow. Mm-hmm. It's been getting a lot of notice, and the way everybody feels, I thought that... Would you mind going into that snake pit and telling our governor I'd like to see him for a few minutes? is in a little financial trouble. Nothing you can't climb out of with a ladder, you understand, but if you could work out a loan with some of your New York banker friends, I sure appreciate it. Consider it done. You're a man to go to the will. <laughs> you hear about this child's funeral tonight? Well, of course. I want us all to be there. Tom, you do not want us all trooping up there. Let those people have their grief. You belong there, John. Believe me. All right. Sally will wear a black dress and I'll carry a Bible as a public gesture. I'm not talking about public gestures. I'm talking about humanity. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking that the man who votes for you loves you. Voting in our democratic society is touted as a, it's just a positive act. It's not. It's negative. Because most people go out to vote against somebody. Well, I guess you're saying that the public... I don't like appreciate... being told what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying. Now, the people are going to be there at that funeral tomorrow to wave the train off that's carrying that child home to Jesus. And I'm talking to you about people and their feelings, not about politics. You're going to dance with me, John Slater, if I have to drag you Governor and I are talking, ma'am. Well, excuse me. It's hard times, John, hard times. A little man is hurting. Cotton's down to five cents. A man can't get work, so he sends his youngins to these, these factories for wages that would embarrass a slave. He's poor, he's worried, but now he's bitter. Because underneath it all, he's decent. I'll be at the funeral, Tom, with the Bible. Small. We stand here, Heavenly Father, a poor and simple people raising our eyes to thee, asking for divine justice. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I commend this child, Mary Fagan, to the eternal and everlasting grace of heaven's warm and abiding love. Amen. Why are you here today, Governor? Same reason we're all here. To mourn the death of a little girl. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Can I quote you? Uh, Mr. Brent, why don't you go back and convince your paper to write some editorials on child labor, huh? Try to get public opinion behind our bill to protect little girls like Mary. Mrs. Fagan. I'm sorry. Very sorry. I don't know you. I'm sorry, I'm Hugh Dorsey, Solicitor General of the State. Did you know Mary? No, but... Who are these people? Did they know my girl? We know her soul and her love. She's here with us while she's been taken away. She's here with us still. Mr. Solicitor, Mr. Uh, Dorsey. Uh, Mr. Brent, now, fellas, please, this is not the place. It's all right, John. I want it stated that one of our children has been taken from us and that this tragedy has not gone unnoticed. As of this moment, I am personally taking charge of the investigation into the death of Mary Fagan, and neither I nor the people of this state will rest until justice has been done. The man who did this to little Mary will hang.
John, I like that young man. Few is ambitious. If ambition was a crime, we could all be hung. So you're Mr. Frank? Yes, Leo and Frank. We've given most of the girls the morning off, sir. You can see what you need to see. I wish you hadn't done that, sir. You must not have understood that notice. I want testimony from those girls. Why? None of them were here that Saturday. They may not have been here that Saturday, but I hear they're telling the police some very remarkable stories. What's going on here? Hello, boss. You must lead an interesting life, Mr. Frank, with more than a hundred young girls working on you. Our employees are treated fairly. Well, if you'll please show me where your office is, sir, I'd like to get started. Yes, this is right down this way. And uh, this is where little Mary was killed. Well, it's, it's, it's what they say. They seem to have found some blood or something. They found some of her hair on it, too. There's lots of dried blood here on the floor. OK. And your office is right over there? Yes. But it isn't just mine. Several people work in it. But not on Saturdays, as I understand it. On Saturdays, you have the whole floor all to yourself. No. Oh, Mr. Schiff is usually here on Saturdays. He, he happened to be away last weekend. I see. Let's go back to your office, Mr. Frank. Jeffries, ask that Doreen Camp to come on in here. Th what does she have to do with it? She wasn't even here on Saturday. Oh, yes, she was. You just didn't see her. More importantly, she didn't see you. Alonzo, why don't you run along? What's your name, son? Alonzo Mann. You the office boy? Yes, sir. Hello, Dory. Come on in, sit down. I want you to tell us again just what you told me yesterday at the office. Oh, Mr. Frank. Why don't you sit here at your desk, just like you said you were sitting? Well, I stopped by about 12.30 to get my pay. And I know Mr. Frank always works on Saturday. But when I looked in the office, he wasn't there. But I was here. Why didn't you knock? Well, I looked and I didn't see you. I, j I just figured you must be someplace else. I, I was right here all afternoon. Maybe the safe door was open. That must be it. You see, it's a big safe. Now, if the safe was open, you wouldn't have seen me, Doreen. What about it, Doreen? Was the door to the safe open? Of course it was. I always leave it open when I'm sitting here doing the accounts. Doreen? I didn't notice. Maybe it was open. I ain't sure. All I know is I didn't say Mr. Frank. Sorry, ma'am. I'm Mrs. Frank. I have my husband's lunch. I'll see that he gets it. Where does this elevator go? To the basement. Can you operate it? I, I can when I have to. I don't much. We have an operator. But he doesn't work on Saturdays, is that right? 
Jim, can you run this thing? Sure, boss. Well, come on. Let's all get in. Give us a ride, Jim. I know you've got your work to do, but we're losing a lot of time. Stop it here, Jim. Let's have a look around. No, what's that? Well, the stairs to the basement. Jim, come here. Show me where Mr. Frank would have you wait. He had me sit right here so I can watch the stairs. Then I give the signal, like this, if some white folks come in. But what in the world is this man talking about? I never told him to sit on a bench and stamp his feet. Why would I want a janitor to behave like that? So you wouldn't be interrupted if you were conducting private business? Of a personal kind, perhaps? What personal business? I work in an office with three other people. Except, it seems, on Saturdays, when none of them is here. I think we've seen enough, boys. Let's go. You can get back to work now, Mr. Frank. Come on in, Alonzo. The state of the bread and the cabbage found in her stomach indicate her death by strangulation to have occurred two to three hours after her morning meal. The dilation of the blood vessels in the female organs, plus the enlarged state of the vagina, indicate the possibility of rape. Very much obliged, Sheriff Mangan. Just holler when you want out, Mr. Rosser. Hello, Leo. Why am I here? I'm doing everything I can. Don't be discouraged. Now, you're only one of several suspects in custody. They've offered to let you talk to Newt Lee. Nobody else has been able to get anything out of him, but uh, I think you should try. After all, you're his boss, and then maybe we can clear up this matter once and for all. Note. Note. Why they do this to me, Mr. Frank? Because you killed her? No. I told them. They won't believe me, Mr. Frank. If you didn't, you must know who did. I, 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 I don't know. Look, look, look what they do to me, Mr. Frank. I, I, I don't know. Uh, well, you'd better tell them what you do know. I don't know nothing. Well, right. tell them that. I tell them that. I don't know. Because we are both going straight to hell.
sit down. Now, Mr. Frank, I'm going to dictate a note to you, and I want you to pick up that pencil and write down exactly what I say. May I see that, please? This the note the little girl wrote before she died? Mary Fagan didn't write that note. The killer wrote it and left it by the body to put it off on the night watch. You don't know that. In the first place, the killer would have seen her right there. In the second, the child was being murdered. Raped, maybe. You think she would have had the presence of mind to find a pencil and a piece of paper and write this while it was happening? Impossible. Isn't that so, Mr. Frank? Don't answer I, that. I don't know what she would have done. I didn't know the girl. Well, if you'd write these words, please. Night Witch. Slim, black, negro. I write, W-R-I-G-H-T, I write, while he plays. with me. All right, Mr. Rosser, you can take your client back to his cell. If you'd be so kind, Mr. Lund, your turn. He knew her. What? He's lying. He knew her. I have this day remanded Leo M. Frank to the custody of Sheriff Wheeler Mangum of Fulton County. He will remain incarcerated here in the tower of Fulton County Jail, awaiting arraignment and trial for the murder of Mary Fagan. Mr. Dorsey, was it dead or right, Mr. Dorsey? I decided not to think about it. When I saw you, I just smiled and said everything was going to be all right. I don't know how to do that. Lucille, what do you know about Luther Rosser? Uncle Sig says he's a good lawyer. I want you to find out if he's the best. If he is, fine. If he isn't, we've got to get somebody better. Can you do that? Of course. I don't understand this. It's all a mistake, that's all. I don't know why it's happening. But I know we'll get our life back. Time, Mrs. Frank. You believe that, don't you? You must. Good night, Mrs. Frank. John! I got it. I got it this time. We have this guy nailed five ways to Sunday. Oh. That factory presents awful opportunities to a man with no conscience. Of course, you know, I don't believe that he planned to murder her. I think she resisted him, and he panicked. Oh, I may have lost a few cases lately, but those days are over. I told those people I'm going to set it right. 
and I mean to. Come on. I'll get Miss Emma to make some of that bad coffee we used to drink before we got too successful to enjoy it, and we'll talk about this. There's no time. Still a lot to do. Listen, I'm not gonna lose this one. I promise you. <laughs> Huey, you do me a favor. You get your conviction. But you try the case in court, and not here. I understand you've hired Luther Rosser. Thank you for seeing us, Mr. Watson. The reason we're here... Please, sit down. Thank you. Mr. Rosser is a fine attorney. Well, you're better, Mr. Watson. You're the best trial man in the state. I don't know that I'd say that. Rosser did. He said he'd be willing to step down or to work with you, if you'd agree. Then I'm certainly flattered. But, uh... Politics and statecraft have kept me out of the courtroom for years. We'll make whatever arrangements are necessary. You must be very wealthy. The money's there. Northern money. Oh, don't get me wrong. Money's money. North or South, only one kind since 1865, much to my daddy's regret. But I wouldn't bandy that about too much if I were you. Whoever's going to be up there fighting for that man's life is going to have a tough enough time as is. My husband is innocent. Mrs. Frank. That jury's gonna be remembering a little child, how she lived, how she died. They're gonna be remembering how that child, like their own, was forced to put away her childhood. To grow up too soon. To go off to work in sweatshops for people from the north when they... when they should have been off playing in the sun. And I tell you, that is a memory that shames their hearts. Mrs. Frank, I'm sorry. I wish you well. such a nice man, paid right up front, always folding his clothes first. Not like some. And if some of the girls didn't care for his peculiarities, well, then they just didn't have to go with him. That's how I am. What kind of peculiarities? Perversions. I don't think that's important. The Lord made each of us as he sees fit. And as long as our private ways don't harm anybody. But now, well... Uh, Go on. A couple of weeks ago, it was a Saturday. Mr. Frank called me. He said a child had been hurt, an accident, he said. He wanted to bring her here to recover, use one of my rooms. I didn't like it. Suffer the little children, but not unto me, not here anyway. So I refused, but he kept calling and calling. Finally, the call stopped. Next thing I knew, I'm reading in your newspaper about how that little girl had been strangled. God rest her. 
Well, that's very helpful. How do I know you're telling the truth, other than your deep moral fiber? Mr. Brandt, this is not the type of business in which one seeks publicity. Now, I've made my peace. If you're not interested in the story... I never said that. Did I? Damn. Now, what the hell am I going to do with this? Wrap fish, I suppose. <laughs> Very funny. Here I am building a rock-solid case while you boys are reading up a vaudeville act. Mr. Solicitor, I understand your concern. It's not Jeffrey's fault. He didn't make up that story. You sure? We all know that your department is not adverse to applying a little pressure now and then. Maybe a threat or two. Was that it, Mr. Jeffries? Or did that woman owe you one? I just happened to be there, that's all. You actually expect anyone is going to believe that Frank intended to carry this girl down to that house of joy? Walking down Peachtree Street on a Saturday afternoon with her body in his arms. Hoping nobody's going to notice. Hogwash. It's just a bunch of hogwash. Not all together, sir. She says that fellow is a pervert. Yes, sir. A pervert. This is Frank. Did you have any idea of your husband's relations with these girls before this incident? No. And it's only since the murder you became aware of what was going on? Not what I meant. Leave her alone. Just trying to get to the truth. We have nothing to say. What about the stuff Jim Conley's been talking about? I have nothing to say. You're crazy, Frank. The man's out to hang you. Why don't you confront him? The trial will prove that I'm innocent. Come on, talk to us. People want to hear your side of it. Well, then tell them the truth. I'm innocent. Hugh, I want to ask you something. Do you really think that man Frank is guilty, or are you just uh, playing to the gallery? Mr. Watson, you think I'd trade on that poor little girl's tragedy? You're talking to the horse now, boy, not some brother soap reporter. I used to have a little dog once. That dog was my best friend. But if I didn't watch him, he'd pee on my leg. The man is guilty. That stuff's true, then? The, the pervert stuff? Could be. I've been talking to some of the girls, the workers. Something going on between them and Frank? Well, you convict that man. That man, Frank and you'll have the gratitude of every decent person in this state. Thank you, sir. Solicitor General of the state of Georgia. He wants you to look like something when you take the stand. Them snap shooters are gonna want to take your picture. Well, Jim, looks like you're the star of the day. These boys from the newspaper want you to make a statement. Hey, boy. Jim, how come they got you locked up like this? Accessory to this killer. That means you helped to do it. They say you're going to speak up. I was intending on taking care of Mr. Frank like he told me. I was going to keep my mouth shut and go off. But some people began to put it on me, make out I killed that little girl. It all got to working in my head so much, I couldn't keep it in no longer. I just decided it was time to come out with it. And Mr. Dorsey been mighty fair to me. And I feel a whole lot better now telling the truth. Now, Jim, tell us, how come you happen to be down at the pencil factory that Saturday? You don't normally work on Saturdays, do you? Well, I mainly work when Mr. Frank say he might need some watching done. Watching? Just what kind of watching, Jim? Well, sometimes he like to have one of the young ladies up to his office for a private chat. Mr. Frank don't like being disturbed when he chatting up the young ladies. 
So I sit on the stairs and sort of stomp on the floor to give the signal if somebody come in the door. What do you think Mr. Frank does during these private chats? What, boss? This talking, all that goes on in Mr. Frank's office. Objection, Your Honor. Overruled. I believe I can predict where this testimony is headed. And I think it might be best if the women and children left the courtroom. Please. Mrs. Frank, you'd best join them. My husband has never done anything in his life that I'm ashamed to listen to. All right, Miss Frank, you may stay. Go on, Jim. Tell us about Mr. Frank's private chats. Objection, Your Honor. My client is a respectable married man. This, this, this testimony is nothing but an absurd pack of lies. The Solicitor General has been coaching this man for weeks to get him to come in here and talk this trash. You'll have your chance at this witness, Mr. Rossi. Did Mr. Frank ever pay you for all this watching you did? Sure did. Paid me two dollars just about every time. Did you ever actually see Mr. Frank with one of these girls? Oh, yes, sir, boss. One time, I thought he had about time to be done with his chat, and I went up to get my pay. I seen one of the young ladies lying back on his desk. He doing stuff I don't know how to talk about. Your Honor, this is an outrage. Your Honor, I believe that this crime against nature is most relevant. Yes. Well, proceed. So, Jim, tell us what happened that Saturday. I was downstairs. I come in a little late on account I was drunk in the night. Mr. Frank already be having his chat, I guess. Because when I come up, he said, Jim, there's a girl up there that's acting sick. And as soon as I seen her, I hollered and told Mr. Frank the girl was dead. She was on the second floor by that bit lathe with that cord tied around her neck. Her face was right about as black as mine. What did Mr. Frank say when you hollered, Jim? Well, he told me to pick her up and bring her in the elevator. I told him I didn't have nothing to pick her up with. He told me to look in the cotton box and bring a piece of cloth. Now, I picked her up, but she was too heavy for me and fell to the floor. I hollered for Mr. Frank to come and help me. Now, he run down there by where I was, and he was real excited. He said, damn it, why should I hang? I have wealthy people in Brooklyn behind me. And then what did you do? Well, he told me to go and get some sacking and put her in it. I'd done it, and we carried her to the elevator and took her down to the basement. To hide the body? Oh, no, boss. Mr. Frank went back up and left me to burn it in the furnace. Did you do it? I couldn't get her in. I went back up and told him. He said we'd both try. We come down, but we couldn't get her in that furnace no way. And then what did you do? I put her back in the cold. And then? And Mr. Frank sit me down, give me the pencil, and told me to write out that stuff that put it on the night watchman. So, this note found beside the battered body of that young child was dictated to you by Mr. Frank. And the words set down on this paper in your handwriting Yes, sir. 
I wrote that out for Mr. Frank. Just what he told me. And then? Then he gave me two dollars, and I went out and got some sandwiches. Why didn't you go to the police? I was scared to, boss. Afraid they'd try and put it on me. Leo, you know, Conley did very well in there. Yes. His story, you know, I, I have never seen a colored handle himself quite like that. He invented every word of it. Is there anything more you can tell us about him? Anything you may have left out. Maybe you forgot about your association. Uh... <laughs> what association? He was a... He was a worthless janitor. A, a drunk. How can you... Leo. If he was a worthless drunk, why did you keep him on? Why didn't you fire him? You believe him? Nobody said that. Leo. You believe him, don't you? No, of course not. We just have to know exactly where we stand. You're afraid of him? The smartest lawyer in the state, and you're afraid of him? <laughs> Leo, Leo, I'm going to do it. I will. I will break him down. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Because if you can't handle him, I'm dead. Now, you follow with me here, Jim, as we take it one more time. When Mr. Frank told you to... Pick up the little girl and bring her in the elevator. What did you do? Just what he told me. Well, what was that? We didn't have nothing to pick up with. So he told me to look in the cotton box and bring a piece of cloth. So you went back to the metal room and got some black and white striped sacking, you say? I didn't say nothing about no white stripes, boss. There was no white stripes. Well, what color was it then? I can't exactly describe the color. Just about the same color as that man's tie. You said the little girl was too heavy for you. How much did she weigh? I, I don't know, sir. Well, let's say uh, 95 pounds. Now, you can lift 95 pounds without any trouble, can't you? I can lift it. Don't know about the trouble. Jim, when you were first arrested, you said you were nowhere near the factory that day. Yes, sir. I lied. And when they asked you about the note, what did you tell them? That I couldn't write. So you lied then, too? Yes, sir. How much did Mr. Dorsey help you with your statements? He just asked me the question. And the answers? Those were mine. How many of them were lies? None. Not by the end, anyway. You're a liar, aren't you? Yes, sir, I guess I am. And every word you have spoken in this courtroom has been a lie, no, hasn't it? No, sir, no, sir. See, like they say, a nigga will lie and lie until he finally decides to tell the truth. I just finally got my fill of telling lies that weren't even my own. I figured, Mr. Frank, if he want to, he can go on telling them for both of us. And that's the truth before Jesus. <sighs> Try a headline like Conley Proves Artful Dodger. As hour by hour the attorneys for the defense hammered away and failed to entrap the Negro, the enormity of the evidence became apparent. Finally came the virtual confession of the defense that they had failed to break Conley's story, and they asked that the evidence be stricken from the record. Jim Conley has stood the fire. Conley is being held as an accessory to the murder. He may be telling the truth, or he may be lying altogether. 
Be these things as they may, he is one of the most remarkable Negroes that has ever appeared in this section of the country. Hmm. Did you believe him? I don't know. I listened to him all day, and I still don't know. I do know one thing. No white man has ever been convicted in this county on the testimony of a black. Oh, yeah, but here you have a black man who's a southerner, a white man who's a Yankee. That's right, I don't know size. Ah. How you feeling this morning, Mr. United States Senator? Is that what the boys in the back room decided? Uh-huh. We've been working on the slate for next year, and you are hitting the ticket. <sighs> we're gonna run old Nat Harris for governor in the spring, and then we're gonna turn all of our attention to sending you to Washington. Oh, you're looking at an old horse who is raring to go. <laughs> Mrs. Fagan, could you tell us, please, what happened the morning of April 26th, the last time you saw your little girl? She was getting ready to go to the pencil factory to get her pay envelope. She was all excited about the parade, and then she left. It was about 11.30. How old was she? Fourteen, yeah. She'd have been fourteen the first day of June. Is there anything else you'd like to tell the court about her? I miss her. Was she a pretty girl? Oh, yes, sir. Mighty pretty. Mrs. Fagan, I must ask you to identify some evidence. No questions. Tell us about that Saturday, Mr. Lund. Well, they laid me off over there, but I forgot a pair of shoes. Left them in my locker. It cost seven dollars. Mr. Frank let me in with a night watchman to get them. Did Mr. Frank seem nervous? Well, yes. He's always nervous as a cat, though. Did you know Mary Fagan? Oh, yes, I knew little Mary. It gets to me that she's dead. Mr. Frank claims that he didn't even know her. Is that true? He knowed her. And when you took him from his home down to the factory to identify the body? He got all nervous and excited. Started rubbing his hands the way they do sometimes. He wouldn't look at the body. Detective Jeffries, uh, I'd like to read you a statement made by the defendant at the coroner's inquest. Regarding uh, the conversation he had with Mary Fagan that Saturday in his office, Mr. Frank says, she asked me if the metal shipment had arrived yet. I said no. Then she left. Now, is this what he told you happened when first you questioned him? No, sir, it isn't. He said she asked him about the metal. That part was right. But what he told me he answered was, I don't know. I don't know. In other words, I don't know if the shipment come in yet. Right. So then, the next thing he might have asked her would logically be, let's go back to the metal room and find out. Objection, Your Honor. Objection. Sustained. And you say that Mr. Frank had never called you at night before. Never had, boss. What did he say? Not much. Just asked if everything was all right at the factory. You're sure that he had never done that before? I don't get too many phone calls, boss. I remember them when I do get them. Mr. Frank had never called me before. Just at one time. And that phone call came just 
a short time before you found the young girl's body. Yes, sir. He would just bust into the dressing room while we were changing. Sometimes he'd come up with some excuse, like saying we were flirting with the boys outside. Were you? Maybe. But only after we finished working. Mostly come in for no reason at all. Once I got mad, I told him, we're dressing, blame it. He just stood there and smiled. I never worked for him, but my sister did. She used to make me go there with her sometimes to get a pay. And this one time she was sick, so I went and got a pay for her. Mr. Frank winked at me and said, how about it? He called me into his office one day saying he wanted to talk to me. He tried to close the door, but I wouldn't let him. He got too familiar by getting too close to me. He also tried to put his hands on me. Where did he put his hands? Let the record show that the child has indicated her breasts. That's what you meant, isn't it, Doreen? Yes. He, he just barely touched him. He tried to pretend like he was joking, but... I'm too smart for such as that. Your witness, Mr. Marcy. No questions? What, what, what do you mean, no questions? Question her. She's lying. Miss Camp, you may step down. Any of those girls? Mrs. Frank, I, I'm afraid you don't understand how these things work. And explain it to me. You see, every time the jury sees a girl up on the stand, it sees Mary Fagan. Dorsey knows what he's doing. Mrs. Frank, if Luther even suggests that one of those Mary Fagans might be lying, it will alienate the jury in a way that will do nothing but harm your husband. Is that the real reason? Or are you afraid there might be some truth in what they're saying? I'm going to tell you something, young lady. You are never to ask that of me or anyone else. Your job is to sit by your husband's side in that courtroom and to believe in him 100%. You understand? Please let go of me. And if you're smart, if you want to get through this, you won't even ask it of yourself. Do you understand me? Lucille, why don't you go home and get some rest? Good night. What if it is true, Luther? He has more than 100 girls working under him. Maybe he did try to flirt with one or two of them. Bite your tongue, counselor. Besides, flirting doesn't make you a murderer. What's the matter? I, I, I want you to stay for a while. Those girls on the stand say terrible things about you. You see. Wasn't I enough for you? Everything they're saying about me in that courtroom are lies. You, you are all I have ever needed. My God. You see you. people in there that can tell that jury what kind of a man Leo really is. He's a respected figure. He's a college graduate, president of B'nai B'rith. He's my husband. Lucille, we're trying. Dean Gilchrist, down from Cornell. He'll speak up for him. We've already written him and others. We're just waiting to hear. Send telegrams. Send train tickets. Whatever you have to do. Mr. Montag will pay. I first met Leo Frank through my position as dean at Cornell University. Now, in his time there, and our association since, I've never known his character to be anything but exemplary. I've brought sworn statements 
from faculty members at the School of Engineering which strongly support this position. Thank you, Dean Gilchrist. I'll be fair with Mr. Frank and not challenge these character witnesses from up north. However, I am moved to ask one question. Sir? Was this college that Mr. Frank attended co-educational? No, it's not. Then you would not know how he conducts himself amongst the fairer sex, would you? As I understand your question, no. I have examined the work Mr. Frank did that afternoon. It's careful work. It must have taken him at least four hours to do it. You'll never convince me that a man can strangle a little girl and then sit down and do four hours of accounting and still keep it neat as a pin. I couldn't have done it better myself. I work right outside of Mr. Frank's office, and I've never seen anything wrong to be going on in there. He's always been a perfect gentleman to me. And I believe he's just as innocent as the angels in heaven. What about Jim Conley? Would you say he's as innocent as the angels in heaven? No, sir. I'd say he's a liar. Objection! Jim Connolly is not on trial here. Sustained. Would you believe him under oath, his hand on the Bible? I don't reckon that book would mean much to Jim Connolly. I've been working in that factory a long time, and I ain't even seen no women going up there, or Jim Connolly watching no door. Most of the time, he'd be asleep, drunk out back. Why would you volunteer to come here and speak against one of your own like this? Excuse me, sir, but he ain't one of mine. Alonzo, would you say Mr. Frank treated you well? He was nice to me. Did you ever see him alone with any women in his office? No. Now, you worked Saturdays as well, didn't you? Yes. And on no occasion did you see him alone with any women in his office? No, sir. You say you never saw any women in his office. Yes, sir. But you don't know for a fact that there were never any. No. Speak up, boy. No. No what? I don't know. No further questions? Mr. Jones, as the insurance agent for the National Pencil Company, you should know Leo Frank well. I got to know him well, yes, sir. What do you think of his moral character? It's excellent. I found him to be an honest manager. He keeps his word, and he makes his payments right on the dot. I believe your company issued an insurance policy insuring Mr. Frank. Did you investigate him before he drew up that policy? I sure did. And I found nothing to worry us at all. He seems a fine, upstanding man, both morally and physically. Your witness, Mr. Dorsey. <clears throat> Tell me, Mr. J. Ashley Jones, in what did your investigation consist? Well, I sent Mr. Frank to a doctor, of course, and visited his wife and relatives, and interviewed his employers. And he seemed fine to me. He is also, if I may add, president of a charity of some sort. I believe it's called B'nai B'rith. <laughs> what about the girls? What girls? The 103 girls that Mr. Frank had working under him at the factory. Did you speak to any of them? No, I didn't find it necessary. Well, if you had found it necessary, you might not be quite so quick to vouch for his moral character. Did you know, for instance, that he kept pictures of nude women in his desk drawer? No, I certainly did not. Did you know that he liked to slap the young girls on the rear? That he often peeked into their restroom? That he made them come up to his office and sit in his lap? Did you know that he often fondled their breasts? He did not. What kind of a man are you, Mr. Dorsey? Have you no shame? Frank, Mr. Frank, please, control yourself, or I'll have you removed. Luther, we've got to do something. For God's sake, stop this. Lucille, I know what I'm doing. 
Leo's entitled to a statement at the end of the trial without a cross-examination. If I put you on now, Dorsey will tear you apart. I suggest, Mr. Frank, that he fail to question any of the girls that work under you because his big northern insurance company doesn't give a sweet tomorrow about little southern factory girls any more than you do. I do. Your name, please? Sigmund Montag. Can't you turn that thing off? I'm supposed to make it cool in here, Your Honor. Well, just make it a noise. You turn it off and open the window. All right, Your Honor. Your name, please? Zygmunt Montag. He's lying! <laughs> and your position? I am the owner of the National Pencil Factory. Jew! Did Leo Frank report the murder to you that Sunday? Yes. Did he seem uh, nervous, as testified? Yes, he did, but, but no more than I. Hang him! Your Honor, I must object. Yes, 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 yes. Sheriff Mangum, see what you can do about controlling some of the folks on that roof out there, will you? Yes, Your Honor. Hang him! A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never Were there any scratches or, or discolorations on his face? A Were you present when the police first questioned him? Not at first. He tried. Not at first. He, he, he tried to call me a short time. have some order in this courtroom. We are nearing the end of a most difficult trial, and we must have order so that we may conclude it. <laughs> 